Hello everyone and welcome to this new video in my series about building sustainability. I'm actually really excited for today's video because we're going to be talking about the future. <laughs> So, if I asked you to think about the future, what sort of images pop up in your head? It can be very dystopian, especially when we look into like sci-fi movies, the kind of future they envision. Like I'm thinking about The Matrix, for example. And then if you Google future in the context of climate change, it doesn't look very bright. <laughs> uh, and that can be sort of depressing and almost paralyzing. So I have that same feeling about the future sometimes. So I was really excited when I found out about this new movement that was actually able to spark some hope and optimism in me. And what I'm talking about is the genre of solar punk. So solar punk is this genre of art that is focusing on a utopian future. And if we're looking into one of the definitions, for example, this one is from Wikipedia. It's about creating settings where technology enables humanity to sustainably coexist with its environment, with Art Nouveau influenced aesthetics that convey feelings of cleanliness, abundance and equability. But it's not just an aesthetic, it's also an ideology and a movement. And I'm going to show you later in the video how it ties back into architecture. But first, let me give you some context. So the term solar punk actually stands in contrast to the term cyberpunk, which I'm sure a lot more of you know. So cyberpunk shows this dystopian kind of postmodern world that is ruled by capitalist corruption and technological authoritarianism. And if you're naturally inclined to focus more on the bad news rather than the positive, like me and most people probably, then you might feel like this is kind of the inevitable future of where we're going, right? But solar punk, on the other hand, is focusing on a, on a future where we use the technology available today in an uplifting manner is where we create a future that is both human-centric and eco-centric. It's founded on the pillars of environmental sustainability, self-governance and strong communities. So when we look at these solar punk art pieces, we see these beautiful worlds of humans living with technology and with nature in, in harmony, right? And it's... And that's why I find so inspiring about it, because it's not denying our past and it's not saying we have to go backwards, but it's about looking forward, looking beyond the beyond climate change, beyond the damages we have done to this planet. It's about saying, well, what can we do with the with the technology we have and to to create worlds that we want to live in? When I discovered solar punk, I actually sent a text message to my friend saying, well, it's basically like if we all just got our shit together. <laughs> and then we both fell down a rabbit hole of researching solar punk and deep ecology. So let me give you some of the background on it. So the term was actually coined for the first time on the internet, I think in 2009, but gained some more steam in 2014 on Tumblr, when Miss Olivia Louise uh, described it as this, a world in which children grow up being taught about building electronic tech, as well as good gardening and other skills. And people have come back around to appreciating artisans and craftspeople, from stonemasons and smithies, to dressmakers and jewelers and everyone in between. And I find this idea of artists and tech really inspiring. Like we have cyberpunk on the one hand that is painting this grim and depressing future where technology is used to suppress and surveillance people. 
And then on the other hand, we have solar punk that is all about collective living and resilience. It's about DIY. It's about using drones to bump seeds into the ground for forests to grow. And of course, it's deeply rooted also in renewable energy sources like solar and wind. It's showing this life that is in harmony with nature without abandoning technology and without a life full of sacrifices. And it fits into the spectrum of bright green environmentalism. So we can recognize three different strains of environmentalism. There's light green, dark green, and bright green environmentalism. So light green environmentalism focuses on the personal responsibility of each individual. They don't seek any radical political change, um, but they see environmentalism more as a lifestyle choice. So basically, if we all do better, then we can improve the world. We can create a better, more environmental world. Dark green environmentalists um, blame our current focus on economical growth as one of the leading causes of advancing climate change. And therefore they seek radical, a radical system change, right? And then bright green environmentalism recognizes that change is needed in the way that we operate our society, but focuses more on social innovation, better designs and new technology. As Ross Robertson writes, Bright green environmentalism is less about the problems and limitations we need to overcome than the looks, models and ideas that already exist for overcoming them. It foregoes the bleakness of protest and dissent for the energizing confidence and constructive solutions. And I can definitely see my personal journey reflected in these different strains of environmentalism. Like I definitely started out in the light green section, trying to reduce my own personal uh, carbon footprint as good as I can, putting a lot of pressure on myself and those around me, like guilt tripping people around me also into trying to cut their carbon footprint, thinking if we as consumers all just make better choices, then we're going to change, uh, that we're going to stop the destruction of our planet. And then you realize how little your like plastic straw though is contributing to the overall pollution and waste and uh, to carbon emissions. And you start to see the bigger picture where you feel like, well, it's just this whole way the system is set up that is leading to the destruction of our planet, of our ecosystem, right? It's like the way capitalism or like our economy and our society is set up that is like rewarding uh, the exploitations of our natural resources and not punishing um, like the the emission of greenhouse gases enough. So you grow, so I grew this resentment against corporations and against the economy. But it becomes in a way overwhelming, right? Because you can stop using a plastic straw, but you cannot, uh, but how do I as one person stop capitalism, right? And even if I could, what would I do? What do I want to, for what com comes afterwards? What do I want to establish afterwards, right? So that's why I found bright green environmentalism so refreshing because it, I, I find it in a way the most realistic, right? It's recognizing where we are today and how we have come here, but it's working towards a way of how, how we can move on, right? How we can use technology and use our knowledge of the nature to create real like real resilience and quite frankly it's also really beautiful so let's though try and tie this back to architecture and um, in the art pieces that i've shown you you can see there's a lot of built environment but beyond the aesthetics of it how can architecture really foster those ideas of community, self-sustainability, and inclusivity. So let me show you this project by Bjarke Ingels. Oceanic City is a project by 
um, big and oceanics as part of the UN Habitat's new urban agenda. It's proposing an entire human-made ecosystem on the water. It's designed to incorporate all of the sustainable development goals. So those were the ones that I was mentioning in my last video. But what I find really cool about this project is the way they designed this. It sounds like the same way when scientists talk about designing a new spacecraft or envisioning life on a different planet. Traditional urban master plan, you typically draw the street grid where the cars can drive and the sort of building plots where you can put some buildings. This master plan, we sat down with a handful of scientists and basically started with all of the renewable available natural resources, and then we started channeling the flow of resources through this kind of human-made ecosystem or this kind of urban metabolism. So Oceanics is this modular system that is fully regenerative, using and recycling rainwater, harvesting the power of wind, solar and water. It's producing all of its own resources like food and also recycling them in a complex waste system. These modules are designed to grow into neighborhoods and cities over time with different varieties of what they call coastal regions, so that you can still get a sense of individuality and playfulness on each of these islands. The materials are light and renewable, like bamboo and timber, which is creating this charming, calm, peaceful environment. So then from top to bottom, you have the solar panels, then electrical farming, aeroponics and aquaponics. Then below that, there is ocean farms to harvest seaweed and oysters and scallops. And then even the point where it's anchored into the sea is using bio rocks to create new reefs. So it's not only generating resources for the people living on top of these uh, platforms, but also working towards accelerating the ecological regeneration. So kind of tying back into this solar punk idea of recognizing past damage and working towards mitigating it. I did not find in any of the research that I've done that this project is actually inspired by the solar punk movement. So this is just a connection that I drew. I think I, could, I was able to recognize a lot of uh, parallels uh, between that in the big project there's also a section about community and fostering community life and so um, just generally the aesthetics of the whole um, project kind of reminded me of that solar punk aesthetics so um, that's where I thought it could be a good example for showing what solar punk architecture can look like and this project is not just a vision. This is actually um, go in progress in as the first time now in the Pearl River Delta. And while this is a tropic climate there, uh, Big has actually developed different adaptations for many different climates. So this project could be um, employed in very different locations. So we're at the end of the video now. Let me know in the comments below what you think about our future. Do you think we're doomed or do you think architects and engineers can help build utopia? I actually discovered the solar punk movement through a TikTok that said, what have I told you? We're all going to make it. Refuse dystopia. And so let that be your spark of hope. We're all going to make it. We have to anyway, right?